Well, good morning, friends, and welcome to River Church's online worship. I'm just so thankful and honored that you've invited me to, into your home. Uh, in just a few minutes, uh, this room will be filled with people, and we will be worshiping here together. But you're not quite ready to get out yet, and so let's worship together virtually. Uh, and, in, and in so doing, you'll be kind of with us today in spirit as you worship online. Now, in preparation for worship, which will begin in just a few minutes, I invite you to do a few things. First of all, you're going to need a Bible and something to write with and something to write on. There's some important questions that we're going to write down today, so make sure you get that. Uh, now, you're going to need communion elements, uh, some kind of bread and some kind of juice or milk or something, because we're going to celebrate communion together. Uh, I invite you to get rid of any, any distractions. Uh, maybe you put your pet out for, for now. Uh, I, I speak first uh, from my own personal experience regarding online worship in our home. Um, and, uh, and then I just want to mention that if you have any questions after today, any questions about River Church, you can go to our website, riverchurchrgv.com, and uh, all things River Church uh, can be found there. Okay, well, let's get ready, and we'll, we'll get rolling here just in just a few minutes. Today is week three of our teaching series entitled Escaping the Lion's Den, a study of God's faithfulness in the book of Daniel. Now, the book of Daniel is found in the middle of the Old Testament, and it's about a young character, a hero of the Bible, named Daniel. The, the context or the backdrop, however, in our own lives is the fact that many of us feel like we are attempting to escape the lion's den of, of, of adversity in our own lives. The lion's den of adversity. Now, if we're honest, that may not even be COVID-related in your life. For some of us, COVID has just done a number on us, and there are many uh, levels of adversity that we're experiencing. But for some of us, it's unrelated to COVID. It's relational. It's financial. It's emotional. It's job-related. It's okay to admit that that although your problem, your adversity may be seemingly small by the rest of the world's standards, God doesn't see it that way at all. It's a big deal to God because your adversity is a big deal to you. When my little child comes to me with, with a problem that, that is heavy on his or her heart, it becomes a problem for me too because I'm a daddy. That's how God sees the adversity that you're going through today. And so we want to, to study our own adversity, but look at it through the lens of the Bible and how God deals with his children's adversity throughout time. The context of the book of Daniel is this, 70 straight years of hardship for the nation of Israel. Imagine that, seven straight decades of difficulty. I mean real difficulty. Many of them are hauled away to captivity, but all of them are enslaved by two countries, first Babylonia and then Persia. And there's this king, King Nebuchadnezzar, who keeps popping up in all the stories. He's the foreign king, he's the Babylonian king, and he's a, he's a big player in this story. Speaking of him, the main characters, aside from this a foreign King Nebuchadnezzar, the, the main characters in the book of Daniel are Daniel himself and then his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. At the beginning of the story, they're all about 15 years of age. They're young Jewish boys, and they're hauled off as slaves to a foreign land. Now, they're hauled off because they seem to be bright and they seem to be handsome, and they're actually taken into the king's court King Nebuchadnezzar in the foreign land. They're taken into his court as slaves, but they're taken in and they're groomed. They're fed good food and they're well-educated that they might one day be esteemed in the king's court. They might be leaders in this foreign land. And that's exactly what happened. They go through all of this adversity, but ultimately they become leaders themselves in a foreign country. The theme of the book, and this is important because it's so relevant to my life, to your adversity, the theme throughout the book of Daniel is this, God's sovereignty over human affairs. Sovereignty meaning his, his rule and his power and his control. We have five cool stories. This week we're on the third story. But with each story we see, what we see is that God is in control. He is supreme or sovereign 
over COVID, for instance. He is, he is in control over your relational difficulties, over your marital problems, over your financial challenges. God is sovereign over that. So week three, uh, the story is this. King Nebuchadnezzar, he mocks God. He makes fun of God. He, he, he turns from God and he turns to himself. He denies God's power and control in his life. And as a result, uh, God turns King Nebuchadnezzar into a wild animal for seven years years and he's left to wander the forest and eat grass like a grazing animal like a wild animal and i'm reminded of what we read last week in exodus chapter uh, 20 where where god says i am the lord your god you shall have no other gods little g before me we're going to jump right into the story today it's, it's rather lengthy, and I'm going to tell part of the story and read part of the story. Um, uh, it, it's kind of fun and kind of amazing all at the same time. It begins, uh, Daniel chapter 1, it begins with this. King Nebuchadnezzar sent this message to the people of every race and nation and language throughout the world. Because remember, this is this Neo-Babylonian period of reign and rule. And so King Nebuchadnezzar is, is ruling the world. He sends this message, peace, peace, prosperity. I want you all to know the miraculous signs and wonders the Most High God has performed. A greater is signs, powerful as wonders. His kingdom will last forever, his rule throughout all generations. This, this is, he's writing now in response to what, what has happened in his life. He says this, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was living in my palace in comfort and prosperity. But one night I had a dream that frightened me. I saw visions that terrified me as I lay in bed. And then if I could summarize the next few verses, King Nebuchadnezzar, uh, he dreams of, of a, large, uh, a large tree that shaded the whole earth. Obviously, obviously this is surreal. A tree whose branches shaded the entire earth, all, of, all that existed under the shadow of its branches. And then a messenger comes down from heaven and orders that the tree be cut down. The branches lopped off, the, the leaves shaken off all over the earth, and, and its fruit scattered that the wild animals might eat it. And then, oddly, the stump is to be left. The stump of the tree and its roots, they're to be left and not destroyed, and a, a band of, of, of iron is, is to be uh, wrapped around the, the tree stump. All right, so then verse 16, it says this, uh, or verse, um, what is that? Verse 19, upon hearing this, Daniel, also known as Belteshazzar, that was his Babylonian name, upon hearing this, Daniel was overcome for a time. He was just over, overwhelmed with his emotion because he, he knew what this was about frightened by the meaning of the dream. Then the king said to him, Belteshazzar, Daniel, uh, don't be alarmed by the dream and what it means. In other words, go ahead, tell me what it means. Belteshazzar replied, oh, I wish, I wish the events foreshadowed in this dream would happen to your enemies, my lord, and not to you. And then, and then I'll, I'll summarize a bit. What Daniel tells King Neb is uh, this dream, King, the, the tree, it's you, man. It, it represents you, O King, this tree that's cut down, the branches lopped off, the, 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 the leaves shaken over the entire earth. That's you, King. Continuing on with the passage, you will be driven from human society and you will live in the fields with the wild animals. You will eat grass like a cow and you will be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven periods of time will pass while you live this way. I'm calling it seven years. Until you learn that the Most High rules over the kingdoms of the world and gives them to anyone he chooses. But the stump and roots of the tree were left in the ground. This means that you, O king, will receive your kingdom back again when you have learned that heaven rules. 
King Nebuchadnezzar, please, please accept my advice. Stop sinning. Do what is right. Break from your wicked past and be merciful to the poor, O king. Perhaps then you will continue to prosper. Okay, so, so Daniel's message to the king is this. This is what the Lord requires of you. This is what the Lord expects of you, king. Break from your sin and show mercy to the oppressed. That would be good counsel for us as well. Break from your sin and be merciful to the oppressed. Going on. But all these things, they did happen to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, he had a whole year to repent. A whole year to follow the, 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 the counsel of, of Daniel and the pleading of the Lord. Twelve months later, he was talking, uh, taking a walk on the first floor of the royal palace in Babylon. And here's where he made his mistake. As he looked out across the city, he said, Look at this great city of Babylon, Babylon by my own mighty power. I have built this beautiful city as my royal residence to display my majestic splendor. He's taking credit for all that he has. While these words were still in his mouth, a voice called down from heaven, O King Nebuchadnezzar, the message is for you. You are no longer ruler of this kingdom. You will be driven from human society. You will live in the fields with the wild animals. You will eat grass. Seven periods of time will pass while you live this way. Get this, until you learn that the most high ruler over the kingdoms of the world rules over the kingdoms of the world and gives them to anyone he chooses. The message is you must realize that 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 king you didn't you didn't uh, accrue your own uh, your own uh, level of, of rule and reign and I mean yeah you fought the wars but but actually anyone who is esteemed God did that <laughs> and I think in this uh, in this period of uh, this this election season I think woe to those of us who who diss President Trump treading on, th on thin ice also the woe to those of us who who dissed President Obama walking on thin ice. God says, I, I raise up kings. I put down kings. And we are to honor and revere that. Going on. That same hour, the judgment was fulfilled and King Neb was driven from human society. He ate grass, cacao. He was drenched with dew. He lived that way until his hair uh, was as long as an eagle's feathers and his nails were were like bird's claws, kind of gross, but that's what happens. After this time had passed, I, Nebuchadnezzar, now he's talking of himself, looked up to heaven after seven periods of time, after seven years. My sanity returned, and what did he do? I, I praised and worshipped the Most High, honored the one who lives. And then he does just that in this little poem. He, he says, his rule is everything, or everlasting is kingdom is eternal all the people of the earth are nothing compared to him he does as he pleases among the angels of heaven and among the people of the earth no one can stop him or or say to him what do you mean by doing these things and going on when my sanity returned to me so did my honor and glory and kingdom and my advisors and nobles sought me out and i was restored restored as head of the of my kingdom with even greater honor than before. That's the kindness of the Lord. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and glorify and honor the King of Heaven. All his acts are just and true, and he is able to humble the proud. The word of the Lord for which I give thanks. King Nebuchadnezzar says, of the Lord. He is able to humble the proud. Here's the big idea today, folks. God values your attention. He values your affection. 
and your humility before him. He will grow, go to great lengths to get your attention if necessary. Do I believe he's going to turn any of us into wild animals? Well, I don't believe so, and I'll get to that later. But I do believe that God will go to great measures, great lengths, to get our attention. Now you would say, but, but Pastor Randy, uh, this guy is a king, and he lived so long ago, and I'm not a king. None of us are kings here today. So how does this apply to us? How does the story of King Nebuchadnezzar apply to us? Look, I, I realize that it may seem unsettling that God would do such a thing. It may seem unsettling that God would demand such respect to the degree that he would turn a king into a wild animal and humiliate him just to get his attention. May I share my perspective on that? What if there's a different way of looking at this? I mean, the fact that the God of the universe wants not only to know me, but he wants to be known by me. He wants my attention. Uh, that's really fascinating to me. He wants me to know him accurately. He wants me, he wants you, he wants us to see him and not only see him as God, but see him as God from a, a, a true and accurate perspective. I've got a couple of ideas here. Number one is this, as I've said, God will go to great lengths to get my attention. Now, is God going to strike me down, make me into a wild animal? No, I don't believe so. I believe that he's done something in this day much more dramatic to get my attention. He has sent Jesus into, into the world to make himself known. The Gospel of John tells us that no one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, Jesus Christ, has come so that we might know him, so that we might see God. That's pretty dramatic. That is this picture of a God who not only wants to know you, but wants to be known. He wants your attention. He wants to win your heart and your affections God is, not only, God is not just interested in some sort of half-hearted relationships. He wants all of me. He wants all of you. And the, the ultimate consummation of this desire is found in Jesus. He came to make God known in a deep way. Do you get that picture? Do you see Jesus? Is he trying to get, get your attention even as I speak today? In the book of Revelation in chapter 2, Jesus addresses the church in Ephesus. And he speaks of this very issue. God doesn't want your half-hearted attention. God wants your passionate attention. He wants your full affection. He doesn't want your dis distracted attention. Ephesians, I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 2, written to the church of Ephesus, but it's written to us as well, dear friends. He says this, I know all the things that you do. I've seen your hard work. I've seen your, your, your patient endurance. I know that you don't tolerate evil people. And God would say to us, River Church, God would say, I, I see, I see that you have some devotion to me. I know that you're working hard as a church, that you don't tolerate evil. But then he goes on and he says this, but, but I have this complaint, complaint against you. You don't love me or love each other as you did at first. Look how far you have fallen from your first love. You've left your first love. Turn back to me again and work as you did at first. If you don't, I will come and remove your lampstands. Harsh, 
cautionary words from Jesus himself. So, so what might Jesus be trying to say to you today? What, what is he wanting you to consider? Have you left your first love, as this said? Do, does God merely get your distracted attention today? Maybe work is now your first love. Maybe, maybe your, your family and, and, and weekend outings, that has risen to the top. It's of most importance. Maybe it's your finances. Maybe it's a hobby, an upcoming race or competition or outing, some sort of hobby. And, and, and that happens to us. We leave our first love and, and we trifle after other things. We are, we are prone to wander, as an old song used to say. And Jesus calls us back with a very serious tone in his voice. He says, I invite you to come back. And then he warns the church of Ephesus, if not, I will remove your lampstand. Now, now God, uh, he would go to great lengths to get my attention, he has gone to the greatest length in sending his own son to, to die a sinner's death on the cross and, and lay in a tomb and then be resurrected and ascended on high. And now Jesus is, is our Lord and our Savior and our, our King. That's, that's a pretty great extent that God would go to get our attention. Uh, but now he is wooing us. He is calling us. He is, he is patient with us as the Bible says, but he is patient toward our repentance. King Nebuchadnezzar had 12 months to respond, but he didn't do it. He kept piddling away at his own life. What might Jesus be trying to say to you today? What's he wanting you to consider? He, he put King Nebuchadnezzar on notice and, and Daniel pled with him and this, the king wouldn't listen. Are you just listening to the voice of the Lord today? Might God be speaking to you? Saying, come on back. Come on home. You've been distracted. You've been wandering. The first thought is that God will go to great lengths to get my attention and the second one is this. God's plan, in King Nebuchadnezzar's case, his discipline, it's always toward my good, my, my reconciliation, my repentance, my returning home. Sometimes we go through hardships for very good reasons. Uh, sometimes we go through hardships for this very reason. I don't know the reason for the hardship you're going through right now, and, and I'm not pretending to tell you what's going on, but, but God wants your attention. God wants my attention. It's important to, to, to him that my, my eyes are, are on him and, and not on me. They're on him and, and not on me. And, and so his plan, even in, the, even in periods of discipline, even in periods of hardship, his plan ultimately, it's for my good. It's like a daddy saying, come on home. Come on home. Like he told the nation of Israel during the, the 70 years of captivity. I'm disciplining you, but in love, not, not destroying you in anger. I am, I'm not abandoning you. I am, I'm getting your attention that I might bring you on home, that I might draw you to myself. James chapter 1 talks about testing and trials and difficulty. And he says that the testing... Uh, or the, the trouble that you go through, it produces endurance, which leads to maturity, which makes you a person who is strong in character and ready for anything. Think on that. The, the desire of our Heavenly Father is that we might be ready for anything. He's building us up. He's making us strong, even in discipline, even in hardships. Even when he's getting our attention, he's waking us up. He's saying, pay attention. I want your full affection. 
All of that, the testing of our faith, the, 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 the troubles that we go through, the hardships, the lion's den of adversity, always what God's doing is drawing us back to himself. Always what he's doing is building our character, making us, quote, ready for anything. Ready for the next task at hand. Ready for the next hardship. Ready for the next battle. In this last section, I have some questions that I want you to consider. And so you might, if you don't already, get out a pen and get ready to write these down and just in your own prayerful way, consider how God might want to answer these questions. In this last section, I have three questions. Now you're watching this, so you're at home today. So you have the luxury of being able to stop um, the video and then start it up again. And it's a, I would encourage you to do that with each of these three questions. Now these are questions that you're not asking yourself. These are questions, questions that you're asking, in, asking of God. You're saying, God, what's your perspective here? If you would just shoot straight with me, God, if you would just tell me, what's your perspective on me? What do you think about me? You ever had your, your, your child come to you and say, hey, Dad, what do you think about me? You think I'm fast? I think I'm good at throwing the ball? Do you, do, do you think I play the guitar well? Do you, do you think I'm smart? Well, let's ask God and trust that he's going to shoot straight with us. It takes quiet time. It takes honesty. It takes some humility. The first question is this, and it'll be on your screen as well. Ask God this. God, what matters to me more than you right now? You ask God that. God, what matters to me more than you right now? That's a tough one because many of us, we have things in our lives that matter more to us than God. You may not even have to ask God. You, you may already know, but ask the Lord to, to speak. Ask the Holy Spirit to speak deeply into your life. Take a moment and ask that question. What, what, is, what has risen to the level of importance in my own heart, God, such that it's now in my mind a God? It's now in my mind more important than you. What is that thing, Lord? The second question is this. God, in what ways am I unhealthy right now, but don't see it or won't own it? Now, there are other people you can go to, maybe a friend or a spouse or a child or a parent, and ask this same question, and perhaps you should. But right now, ask the Lord to reveal to you, what ways am I unhealthy physically, spiritually, emotionally, relationally? Lord, in what ways am I unhealthy? Maybe I don't see it. Maybe I just won't own it. I'm too stubborn to own it. But Lord, reveal it to me. Anything going on in my life physically where I'm just unhealthy? Habits, bad habits, excessive habits. Lord, spiritually, how I relate to you, how I ignore you. How am I unhealthy? Emotionally and relationally. How am I unhealthy? Maybe I won't own it. Maybe I haven't admitted it to this point, but God, would you supernaturally reveal it, it to me? How am I unhealthy in my life right now? You can stop the, the video if you want and pray that prayer. And then the last question, and these are perhaps questions you want to write down and, and use later uh, when you have more space and maybe more privacy if you're other with other people. Maybe you want to go on a walk today and ask the Lord these questions and, and just in the silence of the moment. The third question is this, what would a freer, healthier me look like to you, O oh Lord? What would a freer, healthier me look like? So that's positive, that's, that's forward thinking. First of all, we're evaluating like what, what's unhealthy, but now, Lord, if I was gonna be healthy, if I was going to be free, what would that look like to you? 
Let me just, I want to say this again. I invite you to write these three down. Pray over them right now, but, but, but perhaps more importantly, go on a walk or get by yourself this afternoon. It's going to be a beautiful day. Get by yourself, just you and the Lord, and, and really, really pray these questions and trust that the Holy Spirit will speak deeply into your life. I love you, my friends. I'm rooting for you. I'm praying for you. Better days are ahead. I invite you now to the table of communion, my friend. The greatest act ever committed in God's attempt to get our attention. It's not Noah's flood. It was not uh, King Nebuchadnezzar turning into an animal. It was, the, it was the sending of his son, Jesus Christ, to the earth to get our attention, to, to, to draw us back to him, to provide for us forgiveness and healing and, and wholeness. So we come to the table of communion today in response in humble response. Maybe that's a newfound humility for you. Maybe just today you're saying, I want that. I, I, I want that. And, and you come to the table of communion and we say, in Jesus, we find complete forgiveness, complete healing, wholeness, freedom. On the night that Jesus was to be betrayed, he held up the bread and he held up the cup. And he said to his friends, he said, from now on, when you do this, remember me. He took the bread and he broke it and he gave thanks and, and he and his disciples ate from the bread and he said, this is my body broken for the forgiveness of your sins. And then he held up the cup. He blessed it, he gave thanks, he drank from it, his disciples drank from it and he said, this is my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins. From now, now when you do this, do this remembering me. And so that's what we do, Jesus, with heads held high. You were no victim, you were a conqueror. You conquered sin and death and the grave on our behalf. And so we celebrate you, we celebrate Jesus. So now I invite you right there in the privacy of your own home. Break the bread, drink from the cup, and in so doing, celebrate Jesus. All right, well, that's a wrap. Again, dear friends, I'm Pastor Randy Caulfield, and I'm just honored that you've invited me into your home this morning. Um, if you have any questions, uh, if you need any help of any kind, you can send me an email, randy at riverchurchrgv.com, and we uh, and the elders, the pastors here at River Church, will respond and we'll help you in any way that we can. Randy at riverchurchrgv.com. Now would be a good time for you to go online and give. You're not here to give physically, but you can give online. Go to the website and it's quick, it's easy, it's intuitive, it's safe, it's, it's even kind of fun. And that's the way many of you have been giving during this COVID era. Keep it up that we might meet the needs of the church uh, in, this, in this difficult time. I said this last week, and I'll say it again. Uh, finances are tight, and the Lord has provided. We trust that he will continue to do so. Um, check the virtual schedule on our website. Also, I'll be sending you an email. If you don't get my emails, send me an email, and I'll, I'll get you on the list. Uh, but you'll be getting an email, uh, and also it's on the calendar. We have a virtual prayer gathering this week, and uh, it's going to be a special time. We're going to have a, a virtual uh, 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 community time, a community gathering, uh, I, I believe, on Wednesday night. Uh, so prayer on Tuesday, uh, community night Wednesday, and we're going to have a special guest. Uh, and uh, I'll be there, uh, but a special guest, be kind of an interview type of thing. So hope you join us. Uh, look it up on the schedule and be there went Tuesday night and Wednesday night. I always love seeing you there. Uh, well, uh, that's it. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. I hope you go on that walk and ask the Lord the questions that you wrote down. I'm praying for you and I love you. Take care.